But the more, of course, there is a dictatorship in a country, the more the government wants to block. You use this word to block with CK instead. Yeah. <laughs> wants to block those bloggers, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they are. They are. They don't like criticism. They want to stay in charge. Mm -hmm. What what way and what and, and in Iran, for instance, there is very very fierce law already against bloggers, isn't it? How how do governments react? Uh, well, governments react very strict. It is um, it is a very dual situation because on the one hand. All governments in the in the Middle East are trying to promote the internet. They're building infrastructure so that the people can go online. In Iran, there's already 40% of the population is online, and um, but this brings about also uh, more freedom of information and freedom of communication. Now, governments try to censor this by blocking websites, but also by on the on in the real world trying to arrest prominent blogger, bloggers or people who are active online to spread fear and re, yeah, sort of prevent people from posting content online. Uh, what you see in Iran is that um, digital activists and journalists, independent journalists, became online, went online before the government really saw the threat. So they were already very used to the ways how you can use the internet to mobilize or spread different messages. Well, you see, in Tunisia, the government is, uh, harasses bloggers a lot. They are very uh, repressive, uh, which has led to uh, many uh, critical voices. They had to flee uh, Tunisia. So you, in Tunisia, you see a specific um, situation where local digital activists actually link with the diaspora because they're still very active on censorship and uh, human rights abuses. And this has led to some very concrete examples where um, there's a collaboration between the diaspora and the local activists on, for instance, um, the Egyptian Air, the Tunisian Air Force One uh, was spotted by Flickr in different uh, cities in uh, in Europe, in Barcelona, Rome, Paris, yeah. everywhere in one month. And they found out there was only one official trip for the pre Tunisian president. And it turned out that uh, they made this nice movie about uh, you see this Flickr video and then they fly to a different city with the dates on it. And you see that uh, it was actually the first lady who went shopping in all these uh, European cities. So this came... The wife of the president. The wife of the president. Yeah. And this is, of course, not the way to use Air Force One. So this came into uh, online. This started circulating a lot within the digital activism community. Mm -hmm. And this also became um, an item for the parliament to talk about. And uh, yeah, the president and his wife, they actually got into trouble for using Air Force One for private affairs. And you see that sometimes very small um, things you do online have bigger effects. By the way, there are certain NGOs, non-governmental organiza organizations, that are even training people, for instance in the Middle East, to, to be a smart blogger, uh, a smart blogger that will not be punished, will not be jailed or what, will not be arrested. Uh, what, what's happening? Well, you see uh, international NGOs, you see it in different repressive states, not only in uh, the Middle East, but when you look at human rights activists, when they used to have everything on paper, it was locked behind, so very, it was very protected, it was very well protected. Yeah. But you see that uh, once they turned online, or even their laptop, they had a laptop full of information of other human rights activists, of things that were going on, but they didn't protect it with a keyword, for instance, with a password. Or um, they just posted everything online with their name and their address on it. So if you live in a repressive environment, it's very important that you are aware of these um, dangers and that you learn how to use the internet in a safe way. So either through circumvention or through anonymizing your blog and not posting your face. It can be very small things to very complicated things. And there are international NGOs that, um, yeah, that train uh, bloggers and uh, human rights activists that want to go online how to use it securely. Yes. In the long run, um, this change by the internet, by blogging, might be very positive for democracies, you think? Um, yes, I think so, because as you see in repressive environments that it's hard to meet people, to talk about things, to discuss things without 
always being afraid of that it might be an informant. So people turn to the internet because there's relative more freedom. And you see that um, if a country gets online, they get access to more information, not only about human rights abuse, but more in general, also about different countries, about uh, the way the international community works, just very general information. This makes people think, this makes people less isolated, this makes, uh, yeah, I think this will be the change eventually. And digital activists just try to change the society, and they are the front runners. I think uh, the change will come, and the internet. It has been proven that access to information will, is changing society, so the more people get online, the more it will change. Yes. Thank you very much, Fika Janssen. Fika Janssen will be on the Grand Café Mediterranee at the end of March in Amsterdam. Fika Janssen, uh, you're probably meeting many people from the Middle East there. What do you expect there to find? What do you hope to, to happen there? Um, what I hope that will happen there is because the Grand Café Mediterranée is uh, also about arts and culture in the Middle East. And I think arts and culture has the same, um, the same uh, idea behind the uh, in repressive states as the internet has. It gives people a little bit more freedom to express things, to uh, talk about certain topics that are otherwise... Um, yeah, illegal or hard to talk about. And um, I want to be amazed by all the things artists are doing in these repressive countries and uh, get some inspiration from it. Thank you very much, Fika Janssen. You're welcome.